This episode of Serverless Chats is sponsored by Dexecure. This week, Rebecca and I chat with Kevin Jernigan about MongoDB Atlas Serverless. This is Serverless Chats, episode number 141. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy Daly. And I am Rebecca Marshburn. And this is Serverless Chats. Hey, Rebecca. Hey, Jeremy. How are you doing today? I'm I'm doing really well. Um, I'm excited about our guest, but also I had a really good Monday night. And please go on. Yeah, I went to see Sammy Hagar in the circle. And if you don't know who Sammy Hagar is, I'm, I don't know. My, the age of this audience, I have no idea. Sammy Hagar was the lead singer of Van Halen after David Lee Roth left, but he now has a band called The Circle with Vic Johnson, who is an amazing guitarist, and Jason Bonham, who is uh, John Bonham's son from Led Zeppelin, and then Michael Anthony, who was one of the, uh, or was the original bassist in Van Halen. But I saw him, but I also, opening for him, George Thorogood. Do you know who George Thorogood is? Maybe. No, you don't. Well, you would. So if Bad <laughs> to the Bone, One Bourbon, One Scotch, oh, One it. Beer, I Drink Alone, like all these great songs. Anyways, he's 72, and it was just amazing to see him out there. I mean, he looks 72, right? Like, you knew he was 72. <laughs> but then Sammy Hagar, 75. I mean, when I'm 75, if I, can, if, I could even, if I could even go to a concert when I'm 75, I would be pretty excited. But anyway, so it was a good start to the week. But yeah, anyways, what have well, you I been up to? Well, I got to say, I think that you're still going to be rocking out when you're 75. And I oh, yeah. similarly had a, a past few days, um, one of my closest friends from Detroit is in an 80s rock band, like very similar nice. to Van Halen style. They are from Detroit. They were on tour for the last two weeks, came to Seattle. I got to see them. And it's not every day that I go to a rock show, but it was a rock show. I mean, like nice. moshing and crowd surfing. And I was like, wow, this still does happen. That right? being said, <laughs> when you said what you just did on Monday night, our guest today gave literally on the screen two thumbs up. So... <laughs> I think that we might be in good company today. Would you like to introduce our guest? I would love to. So uh, I had the amazing opportunity to speak at MongoDB World last week. I think we talked about this. And I got to co-present with the senior or principal product manager at MongoDB, who's also the lead product manager for MongoDB Atlas Serverless. So Kevin Jernigan is here with us today. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Jeremy. And I'm very jealous about the concert you went to. I wish I could have been there. <laughs> it was it was pretty exciting. So so before we get started with anything else, let's get a little bit of background here. So tell us a little bit about yourself, sort of where, you know, what your experience has been in the in the crazy tech world that we live in and uh, and sort of what you are doing at MongoDB right now. Yeah. So my experience in the crazy tech world started a long time ago. I when I graduated from college, I got a job with what was a small software company at the time called Oracle. Um, back when Oracle had 800 people. So that was a long time ago. It was 1987. Um, and I was a part of the first product management team in the Oracle database team, which was the first product management team at Oracle. Cause that was the only product we had back then. <laughs> and, you know, I stayed there for four years. We grew fast. We went from 800 to 8,000 people went from 125 million to about a billion in revenue in those four years. So, you know, it's hyper growth times for Oracle and Microsoft, another smaller company that had gone public around the same time and Sun Microsystems, you know, so those are kinds of the peers back then. And, but I left in 1991 after doing, you know, a bunch of database performance stuff. We launched some fancy things like Oracle Parallel Server, the ancestor of Oracle Real Application Clusters and other, other stuff. I, while I was there, um, I wrote the first Oracle database performance tuning guide. And that was based upon the experiences we had with customers after launching Oracle version six, this new row level locking thing that was you know, innovative in the database industry and was targeting real transactional workloads. So customers believed us and tried to use it and ran into a bunch of performance issues. So we worked with them to fix their issues and fix the technology right. and all that and learned a lot about how customers use databases and how they want to, how they want to interact with them and, and, and tune them and, and improve them. And that's why we wrote the book, the performance tuning guide. We then try to productize all that fun stuff. And that was the hard part. Even today, it's kind of hard, but back then it was impossible. Uh, the stuff we wanted to automate, productize, didn't have the data, uh, you know, uh, in terms of workload data, 
didn't have the compute power and didn't have the storage. You know, everything was thousands of times more expensive right. and slower than today. So these were nice ideas that, you know, were just impossible to do back then. And I left Oracle in 1991, did a bunch of consulting in the nineties, built a consulting business, focusing on what we called scalable solutions. So still doing database performance. We expanded, you know, we hired about 45 consultants over time and focused on not just Oracle, but DB2 and Informix and Ingress and, you know, the whole, the whole list of database vendors at the time. Ended up doing a lot of data warehousing, which was, mm -hmm. had just been invented as an idea in the early nineties. So we, we were chasing the holy grail of a one terabyte data warehouse, which was really hard to build <laughs> back then. Seriously, it took like a week to load a terabyte across thousands of disks. It was crazy. Thousands of tiny, expensive disks. And, you know, eventually, you know, we sold that business right at the beginning of the dot-com bubble. I, you know, continued to do a bunch of consulting. I started another software as a service business, focused, believe it or not, on the health and fitness industry, because I've been an active squash player most of my life. And I wanted to book a court online, which doesn't sound that hard, except even today in 2022, the health club industry still doesn't do a good job of online self-service for their members, right? So, you know, we tried and failed to build a successful business. We built a very good platform, but not a successful business in that industry. Lots of barriers to selling technology to health clubs. I'll just <laughs> leave it at that. Uh, went, went back to Oracle in 2009. So I'd been away for 18 years, came back, you know, to the same pr product management team, of course, was a much bigger company, like 60,000 people. And Oracle was in the process of, uh, acquiring sun at the same time. So we right. suddenly jumped from 60 or 70 to like 110, 120,000 employees. And so, you know, very big business, but I was in the middle of the product management team inside of the Oracle database team, same team I left 18 years before focusing again on storage and performance related stuff. So I ran a small team. We launched about a dozen different things while I was there for about six years. And again, the same challenge was there. It's like customers wanted to do all this performance tweaky stuff. They wanted to get, get their hands in there and change every parameter, turn all the dials and knobs just to make it perfect for their workloads. And still didn't have what, you know, I thought we should have had, you know, 20 years ago. The ability to do that automatically and mm. to do it at scale and to understand across customer workloads because Oracle didn't really have a cloud focus back then. And so when the opportunity came up to, to leave Oracle, to go to AWS, you know, just made sense for me to, 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 to do that. And so I joined AWS as part of the, what technically part of the RDS team, the relational database service team, but within the RDS team, I worked on the Aurora Postgres project. So I was changing gears from Oracle to Postgres, but it's still relational. So mental model wasn't going to change that much. The more important thing was moving into the cloud and understanding mm. how customers were using the cloud and specifically trying to use databases in the cloud. And, you know, at AWS, the, you know, the opportunity was there. Well, Hey, we have visibility into all these customer workloads. Yeah. We can't go look at their data that would violate privacy stuff. We, you know, but we can certainly see some level of metrics and characteristics about how their data, how their workloads, you know, work over time and different patterns and seasonality, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, annual, whatever it is. But we still, you know, we're blocked to a large degree in terms of implementing the kinds of automation and kinds of, not just automation, but kind of uh, proactive uh, tuning, I guess, or automatic self-driving, if you will. We're still blocked from really doing a good job on that. Partly because all the database engines we were running were somebody else's, right? Because right. RDS runs Oracle and SQL Server and MariaDB and MySQL and Postgres. The Aurora projects are based on Postgres and MySQL, still dependent on those open source projects where the more changes we made to Postgres or MySQL, the more merge burden we had because mm -hmm. we needed to stay close to the main line of those open source projects. So if we we're going to take the next release of Postgres and adapted into what we did in Aurora Postgres, the more adaptations we added, the bigger the merge bird and the harder it was to keep up or harder it would be to keep up without introducing Aurora specific bugs, et cetera. So we were, we were pretty limited in, in what we could do without, you know, taking on all that extra work on an ongoing basis. We we're also limited as I kind of discovered over time by the relational model itself. And so when the opportunity came up to actually leave AWS for MongoDB, that was a bigger change for me actually than going from Oracle to AWS. Going from on-premises to the cloud wasn't as hard to get your head around or get my head around as going from, you know, I've been doing relational for 30-ish years and now I'm going to 
think about non-relational and document model and all that. And why is this so interesting? I mean, why does MongoDB even exist as a company? What happened that they got all this traction and they're, they're doing so well. Um, so I had to, you know, dig in on that before I felt comfortable moving, you know, into that, you know, moving away from AWS to take the role of MongoDB, you know, but joining MongoDB, my focus from the start has been, uh, working on our serverless offering. And I've been here about a year and a half now. So I joined early last year. And I joined and then we went, we launched the preview of Atlas Serverless in July and we went GA last week at MongoDB World. And what I've, you know, one of the things I've learned is just how customers use MongoDB. Certain things are just so much easier than what customers or developers have to do to use a relational database. So it's nothing to do with the cloud, nothing to do with serverless. This is just mm. core document model versus relational. One of the things that, you know, you just take for granted when using a relational database is that to change the schema, you're going to have to do some gymnastics. You might have to take some downtime. You, you have to worry about the schema up front and you have to think through, oh, you know, okay, I'm going to have these kinds of tables and they're going to be related this way. I got to build these indexes. Maybe my, my tools, my development environment will build those for me, but I still have to think conceptually that way. And that was all driven by how expensive storage was right. in the sixties and seventies. Right. And so when you think about it, the relational model is optimized for, for re minimizing how much storage you use to store your data. And that made sense. Storage was insanely expensive. Remember the Y2K problem that came from storage being right. expensive. Let's not right. put one nine in the date because that, let's save those two bytes. Saves us a lot of money at scale. We fast forward to the 20 years ago, even storage was getting pretty cheap. And of course it's a lot cheaper now. So why are we still using a model that's optimized to minimize your storage footprint when that's right. like the cheap, fast part of your system. And so the document model that MongoDB uses is really, you know, focused on optimizing for something different than your storage footprint. And so when you start thinking that way, like, Hey, Hey, wait, you're right. If I optimize that way, then these other things get better. And one way that that shows up is just in how you model your data. Data modeling in, in MongoDB, you, the way we, the way we phrase it is, you know, data that gets accessed together, gets stored together. Right. So that, you know, if you're looking up all the data about a customer, if it's all stored together, you just do one or a couple IOs of uh, contiguous data to pull it into memory and it's all there. In a relational database, you pull a bunch of rows from a bunch of different tables and then you do a join to, to, to connect them all together. Well, guess what? That takes more CPU, but it takes right. less storage. Right. right. So you've optimized for the wrong thing, you know, so if you optimize for faster access at the cost of maybe storing data more than once. So yeah, you're wasting storage, quote unquote wasting, but your, your access times are much, much faster. Mm -hmm. And so that core, th you know, difference in the document model kind of filters through everything we do and everything that developers benefit from using MongoDB as compared to relational. So that was kind of the first transition. But then of course we have our own cloud, our own managed Mongo database, MongoDB in the cloud service called Atlas, which runs on all three of the major cloud providers and going serverless is kind of the big next step. And you can't really do serverless well, unless you get to the point that you can automatically manage most of what people manage by hand in right. databases. Right. And so inevitably, from my perspective, inevitably serverless is going to lead to down a path of automatic fleet management, automatic scaling up and down, you know, automating things like indexes, automating things like schema optimizations, all that stuff, we need to make it transparent and automatic so that developers don't have to worry about it, even at scale. I mean, right. it's all, it's easy to make things fast when there's, you know, five documents or five rows in a table. It's when you yeah. scale and have a million users and you know, billions of rows that, that, that automating it is, is harder. But that's, that's where I think we're headed. Yeah. So I want to get into all that stuff. Um, but first, I've got to apologize to our guests, because clearly after we've heard your background, you have no experience in this at all. So you're clearly not the right guest to be talking about this. But, but other than that, no, amazing. Absolutely. I mean, you've seen all these different things. And I think that's one of those, I, I forget uh, who says this, but you can't, there's no compression algorithm for experience, right? So you can't just, you know, go in and start working on relation or non-relational databases or whatever, no SQL databases and have that same perspective. So amazing that you have that perspective, but I know Rebecca has some questions that she's itching to get to. So I do. Sure. I think that's a Wernerism, by the way. Um, it might not be a Wernerism, but I think it is. I think it is. Um, he can correct us it's on that. It's Werner 
or Andy Jassy. Yeah, it, might, it also right. might be Point Andy Jassy. Yeah. If it was, maybe I wrote that. Um, no, I didn't. I did not write that line. I wish I could clear <laughs> <that>. <laughs> Right. Andy, I'm sorry. So that was an amazing con- You were, so from the dawn of Oracle, ba- little baby Oracle in 1987 to serverless today, I think before we get too far into MongoDB Atlas for our listeners, we should, there's actually an incredible stat that you referenced in your recent talk. And I think it's really helpful to even benchmark where serverless is and was even two years ago to talk about where we think serverless is going and how MongoDB Atlas serves that. So in your talk, you noted that the global serverless architecture market was valued at $7 billion USD in 2020, and it's projected to reach $37 billion USD by 2028, which is a 22% growth rate year over year. And that's according to verified market research. We always like to attribute it stuff. And that also means like there's going to be a lot more voices and have been a lot more voices every year in terms of their use cases, their edge cases, where they want to go, how they want to use it, the futures and ideas, what they think they can solve with it, how they want to stretch into that that are stepping into serverless or that are now familiar enough with it to keep building on it and want to do more complex things or solve different problems with it. And so I'm curious, even in in that benchmark context, right? Like serverless is growing a lot and has already been growing a lot. How at MongoDB did you decide like what the right next thing to build is? And then how was that, for example, in terms of MongoDB Atlas? Like where did you arrive there where you're like, okay, this is where the market's going and this is what our customers need today? Yeah, so MongoDB has always been, you know, a developer-focused company, right? The, you know, since way before I got here, that's how the company grew from, you know, zero to, to where it is today was by really focusing on developers. I mean, that's, that was really the motivation for building the Davis in the first place. You know, the original, uh, you know, founders, uh, Dwight Merriman and Elliot Horowitz, wanted to make it easier for developers to build applications, and they had built a bunch of applications themselves, and, you know, before before starting MongoDB and, um, they were writing code like every other developer in the two thousands that manipulated JSON objects and storing JSON objects in relational sucked because you had to use an ORM to rip it apart into tables and rows and columns. And then the ORM would reconstitute it back into JSON, just an impedance mismatch. There was a lot of friction there. Lots of opportunities for mistakes and translations and SQL statements getting wrong and all that crap. And so they just said, well, let's, let's put together a database that stores data in the form that I use it in my code. So the motivation from the company of the company from the beginning has always been developers. And as we grew, it made sense for us to build and manage Manga database service in the three major cloud providers, because developers were starting to build stuff in the cloud and they were downloading MongoDB and managing it themselves on, you know, an EC2 instance or the equivalent and the other cloud providers. So it just made sense for us to say, Hey, well, they're complaining about all the work they have to do to build and manage databases and do upgrades and patches and, and all that fun stuff. Why don't we just take that load off their back and we'll do that with Atlas. But Atlas still at the time required them to think about infrastructure. You know, you provision an Atlas dedicated instance today, you have to decide how big your instance is, you know, how many CPUs, how much memory. And of course there's a price with that. And so you're looking at the cost as well. Oh, and how much storage do I need? And do I need more storage for more IOPS, not just for storing data? So you have to think about all that stuff as a developer who's just trying to build a, an app that you might just be playing around with that might take off someday and into some big viral thing. But you don't want to think about all that infrastructure. And so serverless is kind of the obvious next step where in, in that developer journey in that, well, let's just give them a magic endpoint and that's it and let the endpoint figure out what they need based upon how they're using it. And so today in Atlas Serverless, they choose a cloud provider and a region and they give their database a name and that's all you have to do. And then you create a database or create what we call an Atlas Serverless instance. But that really just gives them an endpoint that behaves just like a regular non-serverless endpoint, still running MongoDB, the same MongoDB code. Just, they don't have to think about how many CPUs or how much storage or any of that stuff. We just automatically scale up and down and build them for what they use. And th- that's what, you know, that's what developers have been asking for. That's why we started on the serverless project and why, you know, why I think we're going to head in the directions I, I've been talking about that we're going to keep making it easier and we're going to keep making it more magic, right? It's right. not magic. It's all just real understandable technology, but it's going to feel like magic to, to most developers. Yeah. And you, you had mentioned this idea too, of like, you know, just the founders originally want to make it easier for developers to build 
applications um, and, and just to do it more, you know, not only more quickly, but just easier, like reduce that friction. And uh, David Acharya, you're the CEO of MongoDB, uh, in his keynote actually gave this quote, and I, I pulled this quote out because I thought it was really interesting. It said, or he said, everything we do is all about removing friction and increasing developer productivity. In the eight years I've been CEO of this company, customers have told me many things, but no customer has ever complained about innovating too quickly. Legacy architectures with brittle and inflexible characteristics are what have held people back. So, I mean, that was just, I mean, right. I mean, you summing it up, right? Like this is the problem, right? Like we have all this old stuff and not only do we have old stuff, but we have old stuff that we've now moved to the cloud. So we, it's like you're doing the same old stuff. You're just doing it in the cloud now, right? And we talk about cloud native. And again, I have a real big problem with what we've, you know, sort of ascribed or subscribed or whatever to, uh, to what that term is and what that actually means. But I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Like, you know, th this seems to be, even at, even at the time, MongoDB a little bit, was, you know, I think the older version of MongoDB a little bit more legacy. And now we get to Atlas and that's more cloud related and you get to serverless and you get to those other characteristics that we want to see. But I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah. So there's a few things, a few dimensions to talk about there. One, um, even though MongoDB obviously was, you know, architected originally way before the cloud was much of anything, though right around the same time AWS was launching was when MongoDB was created as a business. 2006, 2007 time frame, but you know, back then it was obviously not cloud. Wasn't a thing you were going to target. And, but the, the way they architected MongoDB even back then. So the name MongoDB comes from humongous. They wanted to build a database that could handle humongous scale because they felt that relational databases could not handle the scale of, you know, web-based applications that they saw already being built and they saw more and more coming. And so it was all about scale, right? So they wanted it to handle humongous things. And so they called it MongoDB, Mongo database, right? But because of that, they built in uh, the ability to scale out, not just scale up. Mm. And by that, I mean, scale up is, you know, you scale up to the limits of the biggest computer you can find. And the bigger the, you know, the way you make computers bigger is by adding more CPUs and making the CPUs faster. And, you know, what people sometimes still call SMPs or symmetric multiprocessors. Biggest, you know, system you can get today probably is 64 CPUs, maybe 128 at the high end. But what happens if you can't scale up? If you need more than that, you know, more power than that, that big server, you need to scale out. You need to spread your workload across multiple servers. And so they built that into MongoDB from the start with, you know, what we call sharding, which most database people call sharding, to help you scale out your workload across multiple servers. So that was built in from the beginning. Now that plays really well in the cloud when the cloud came along later. The other thing they built in from the beginning was a high availability architecture using what we call replica sets. And a replica set is simply a set of servers, each of them running a copy of MongoDB's code that work together to provide high availability for the data that that replica set's managing. So there'll be a primary and multiple secondaries. Kind of needs to be an odd number when you think about failure cases so that when you have, say, split brain, you know, if you have a three member replica set, one of them gets split from the other two by a network outage. You have to have two out of three to vote together to recognize that we have a majority, right? Simple stuff in terms of, you know, database, uh, how databases work these days, but this was kind of new for building a database in the mid two thousands. And so those two things, replica sets with the, the, the high availability model, plus the scale out capabilities of sharding were built in from the start which plays really well when you move into the cloud. The high availability model plus the scale out model in a cloud environment makes MongoDB work, you know, really well at scale, especially when you have, you know, the typical scenarios in the cloud at scale, there's always something failing somewhere. And you need to build it. You need to write your, write every line of code you write, assuming that something's going to fail, that everything's going to fail. And so, you know, they were thinking that way from the start. But then the other dimension you talked about is, okay, I've got all these legacy things where, you know, legacy to me means relational, even pre-relational, some of the older mainframe stuff. How do I move those kinds of applications off of their, you know, old, relatively expensive on-premises infrastructure into the cloud? A lot of customers are doing lift and ship. They just take the workload and move it into the cloud and say, Ooh, now I'm in the cloud. And I should be saving money or I should, you know, I'm not, I'm no longer managing my own data center and paying my own people to, you know, re-rack uh, servers and swap out, you know, disks when they fail um, and paying for power, space and cooling. That's, that's handled by the cloud provider. 
uh, you know, in my experience, that's five to 10% of the benefit of moving to the cloud is just lifting and shifting and no longer being responsible for the data center. The, the real benefits come from actually re-architecting for the cloud, uh, taking advantage of things like MongoDB that are, you know, optimized for cloud environment. And, you know, in the case of MongoDB, moving from, say, a relational database to MongoDB, you get those other benefits we talked about earlier of, of going with uh, the document model versus the more rigid, rigid schemas that you have to follow to use a relational database, which opens up a whole bunch of speed and agility for developers since they're no longer hitting that friction of, of working with, you know, an ORM in the middle, um, object relational mapper in the middle and working with, you know, a DBA on the other side, who you have to schedule your schema changes with, you don't, you don't have any of that friction anymore. You can just go as fast as you want to go when you're working with MongoDB. Then with Atlas and serverless in the cloud, the whole idea is just to let's just get out, get out of the way as much as possible, which this again, give them that magic endpoint. But what you'll see if you dig deeper in what we, some of the stuff we announced last week at MongoDB World is a focus on helping customers migrate workloads from relational into MongoDB or from self-managed MongoDB, either on premises or self-managed in, in the cloud into Atlas. Um, so we're, we're part of our focus in that developer data platform is to help customers migrate those legacy workloads, whether you consider legacy self-managed Mongo or whether you consider legacy Oracle, you know, SQL server, DB2, Postgres, MySQL, whatever, whatever relational source it is, we're, we're working really hard to help customers move those workloads. Though one of the stats we like to throw around is there is some stat I, I, I unfortunately can't quote the source because uh, I don't remember it. But the, the next five years, something like 750 million new applications will be built. Mm -hmm. And, you know, more than all the applications that have been built in the last 40 years. Right. And so, you know, our, a big part of our focus is making sure developers know all the advantages of building those applications on Atlas with MongoDB rather than, you know, on a relational database. Right. And you keep talking about relational databases to the document DB model. And, and you mentioned earlier that that idea of, you know, writing an ORM or something that transforms JSON into, into, you know, relational data. And I just had a waking nightmare because I remember writing nested sets. If anybody has ever used nested sets, it's a really brilliant technique for creating hierarchical data in a relational database, oh, but yeah. it is a, it's a nightmare. I've done that before by hand. Yeah, that's before, what I did. before JSON existed, I know what you're talking about. Right. I was yeah. actually using it to do XML, uh, to yeah. constitute XML documents and split those apart into relational data. It was very cool stuff, but also so much easier just to drop a JSON object in there than to well, uh, do that. Yeah. When you're done with that, you're really proud of yourself because it's really cool. It is. And then, cool. you, and then you realize, wait, this doesn't scale. <laughs> right. I don't. I don't <laughs> scale. I don't really want to count on finding people who do this really hard stuff to, to right. scale my business or scale my application. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Dexsecure. Dexsecure empowers web developers by automating tasks that are essential for every website, freeing up developer time to focus on building. Dexsecure currently has three products to help your team. Their web asset optimizer optimizes content like HTML, images, CSS, JavaScript, fonts, videos, and more. Their third-party optimizer takes care of all your third-party assets, and their intelligent network optimizer enhances the performance and resiliency of your website. Dexsecure also has an open source product called Open Dexsecure, a cloud agnostic edge development framework. Now what I love about Open Dex is that the developers can jump straight into product building and not worry about dealing with setup and all the other roadblocks that come from the complexity and configurations of other popular CDNs. If you're interested in trying Dexsecure's products, you can for free. Just visit Dexsecure's website at Dexsecure.com to sign up and learn more. That's D-E-X-E-C-U-R-E dot -E com. Something that stood out to me, and I do, I also love that uh, quote by Dave, uh, the MongoDB CEO, um, but that last line, right? He had said, legacy architectures with brittle and inflexible characteristics are what have held people back. And I mean, on its surface, certainly I agree. And even below it, I agree. But I, I bolded that because I've been thinking about this a lot recently, but someday serverless will be legacy. And we often couple legacy and brittle together. And 
it, I, I think, I mean, that's so many things, right? It's because it, it is built on older technology. It was, you know, on-prem, then people just move it to the cloud. And then now we just have this problem in the cloud. And there's so many things smashed together. And so there's so many pieces that could break. But are legacy and brittle inherently tied? Or like, how do we keep that from also being the fate of serverless, especially as we keep adding bells and whistles, adding knobs, adding things that you can change or decide on or all these things that used to be in Jeremy and I talk about this a lot. Maybe it's the theme of this season, but it's like we love serverless. Also, how do we actually keep it um, that idea of simplicity that keeps that idea of undifferentiated heavy lifting, as AWS would say, right, or non-differentiated work? away from the developers having to do all those things just so you can totally focus on your code. So is brutality <laughs> and legacy also the fate of serverless? And how, how do we prevent that, right? How do we either change our paradigms or our thinking? Or is serverless too just one day the next brittle legacy app? Yeah, well, if, you know, on the one hand, if you could predict the future like that, then, you know, <laughs> Go, then you'd be working at an analyst. <laughs> yeah, well, no, you wouldn't be working at all. <laughs> you you would have sold out of Bitcoin, you know, three months ago. Um, yeah, so I think serverless is going to go away, but not really. It's going to go away as a term. Yes. You know, so in my naivete, when I was still at Oracle the second time and I was considering the opportunity to go to AWS, you know, at first I thought the cloud providers, not just AWS, but all of them, were already delivering databases serverlessly. But I didn't right. use the word serverless in my thinking. I just assumed that, you know, in RDS, because I hadn't touched it yet, you know, I hadn't tried it out before my job interviews. I assumed before I tried it out that I would get an endpoint that just did what I needed. I thought they had already figured all this stuff out. All right. And when I got to RDS, I was like, wait, this is kind of clunky. I have to provision infrastructure. Just a, bit just a bit clunky. Can you just be smart of this? You guys, you guys are already at scale. What the heck? Right. And, you know, then I get there and I realize, well, it's a lot harder than, than I thought, right? And for a whole bunch of reasons. But it turns out that, Jeremy, I mean, you, you say this in your talks all the time, the most of AWS's early services that they launched with were serverless in the sense that there are a bunch of servers behind S3. And there's a bunch of servers behind EBS and a bunch of servers behind all these different services, which the customer has no idea what they're doing. They mm -hmm. can't see them. They can't tune them. They can't monitor them. They, they shouldn't have to, you know, but it's AWS's job and Azure and Google Cloud and the rest of them is their job and their challenge to provision a bunch of servers in a big data center with, you know, CPUs and memory and storage and pre present uh, the S3 behavior to the customer in a way that is affordable, that works, that scales, and that doesn't lose money for the cloud provider. I mean, they got to make money too, or else they go out of business, right? So how do you do that at scale? with the right performance and availability characteristics, but at a low enough cost. And there's a whole bunch of hard work you have to do in the technology to manage density across a fleet of servers and, and do all the right things to, to, to give that experience to customers. And doing that for databases is the hardest thing um, because customers or developers expect their databases to you know, not lose their data and to be consistent and to be transactional and to scale and to not crash when you look at it sideways, you know, they expect all those characteristics doing that at scale and not losing money as the provider is actually the really hard part. So I think serverless is going to go away as a term because that's going to be the only way you consume things in the cloud eventually. Right. Right. It's just that databases have always been the hardest thing. So that's why it's the last thing that you're seeing go that way. But, you know, fast forward five years from now, I don't think we'll call it serverless. But, you know, so, you know, Rebecca, when you ask about legacy, yeah, I mean, what's going to be the next thing? I, you know, if, if I go way out on a limb, I'll, I'll say that a lot of the stuff's going to get burned down into uh, chips, into, you know, workload specific chips. We're seeing it a lot already, right? I mean, you know, uh, uh, in the Apple ecosystem and, and the ARM chips they're using there or in the Graviton you know, specific chips that AWS is, is building. I think we're just going to see more of that, right? And so the stuff we're talking about now, we're writing in software that runs in processes in Linux and, you know, with all the, the good and bad parts of that. Once it's really nailed down, we'll be able to burn it in the chip and then it's going to be a different thing. It's just going to be, I don't, I, I'm reluctant to use the word intelligence because that gets into AI. But there's going to be that kind of magic, magic capability, but it's going to be burned down into chips rather than 
software running on general purpose servers. And why would that be better? Well, it would probably be cheaper and faster. It's like um, embedded efficiency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, I'm way out on a limb here, but because I'm 10 years out. But <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, I'll, know, go, I'll go out on a limb. I'll <laughs> say the next things that will be legacy will be Java as a language mm, and mm. Kubernetes. But that's just me. Kubernetes. I'm just, you know, I, I think that, uh, well, Kubernetes is already being absorbed. 75%, 80% of Kubernetes clusters are already run by managed service providers. So you're oh. not even managing them yourself. So basically it's just a hosting platform. Um, yeah. But anyways, yeah. but yeah, so let's talk about serverless databases for a second. And you said this a couple of times. I said this in my talk. I say this all the time. And it's clear based off of a lot of the offerings out there serverless databases are hard. They are just really, really difficult to do and to do well. And again, I think you could do them and lose money on them, right? But so if you want to do yeah. them right and not lose money, it gets, uh, it gets a little bit tricky. But so beyond just the obvious things, right? So you've got responsiveness and scalability, right? Obviously, those need to exist in a serverless database. Uh, also, serverless, serverless developers, they want integration with their serverless tools, you know, like frameworks and so forth. Uh, I think cloud provider flexibility is a huge thing. You know, I mean, if, if you have a database that only runs at AWS or only runs in Azure, that becomes really hard, especially where, you know, depending on where you're building your application. Like maybe if your application runs in AWS, you don't want to host your MongoDB cluster in Azure because your data is so far away from your application. You want to get those close. Um, and then, of course, uh, consumption-based pricing is the biggest thing. So how has uh, how has MongoDB, Atlas, Serverless, how has that addressed a lot of those concerns? Yeah, so, I mean, you touched on multi, I'll, I'll talk about multi-cloud first, that, yeah, the, from early, the early days of Atlas, you know, way before Serverless, we focused on making sure it ran the same way in all three of the major clouds so that customers could do exactly what you described. They could say, well, okay, I've, I built my stack on, on AWS, in this specific location, because my current customer base is there, I want low latency all the way around. So, gee, I want my, you know, managed MongoDB database to be in that same exact location geographically. And, you know, the cloud providers don't have identical coverage geographically, right. uh, first off. So we wanted to make sure that kind of at a base level that we could address customers' needs in terms of where they're building the rest of their apps. And, you know, some customers are deep into AWS, some are deep into Google, some are deep into Azure. So we didn't want to force them to learn how to do stuff in a different cloud provider than the one they know today either, right? That was kind of a, a basic thing. But then we built multi-cloud. And by multi-cloud, I mean true multi-cloud. And, and Atlas, um, for I think the last two or two and a half years or so, you've been able to build a, a single Atlas database cluster that spans regions within a cloud provider and will also span cloud providers within a single mm -hmm. database. So remember that replica set capability that we built in from the start with the primary and multiple secondaries? Well, those that primary and secondaries, they can be spread across different cloud providers. They don't have to all be in the same cloud provider. And so we routinely demo this where we say, well, here's here's your Atlas database running in you know AWS in US East 1. Oh, and wait, you want to migrate to US West 2 in, in, in AWS? Well, you just create another replica set member in US West 2, we hydrate it automatically, and then you can just fail over to it. And now you're in another region. Mm. Or you can do the same by going from AWS to Azure or GCP. You don't have to do a bunch of migration of data yourself. You just create another replica set member and we do it for you. And it's really just push a button on the console or make an API call to do that. You don't have to migrate. You can just, continue, you can just run that way, you know, with different, different replica set members in different cloud providers. So that's a big win for a lot of customers where they may not run that way, but they, they may want to be able to move stuff around over time. Some of our bigger customers are in M and A scenarios where, yeah, we're all on AWS, but then we bought a company that runs in Azure mm. and now what do we do? Right. You know, and so it just makes it easier to, to rationalize, to do whatever they feel like doing. They can just stay at two clouds. They don't have to bring it all in one, but some customers want to, they want to know it's going to be easier to, to bring things together. Well, let, let's talk about that data API a bit. Yeah. What the, what, what is it? How does it differ from the standard MongoDB connection model? And when or why should Jeremy use it with his serverless applications? Huh. Yeah. So before the data API, you know, we built up pretty much from the early days, a bunch of drivers, support for a bunch of different drivers from a di bunch of different languages to connect to your MongoDB database. 
And of course, you know, customers use these drivers or however they use MongoDB, whether it's community edition that they just download and run on their own or the enterprise advanced version with, you know, extra support and tools or Atlas, you know, in the cloud. So we have support that we build, that we manage internally ourselves for a bunch of drivers. There's also some open source drivers and there's about 20 or so of them. And the drivers have lots of functionality to manage connections and, and do things at scale that, that are, that are pretty useful, but they're drivers. And if I'm writing, you know, Lambda code and I want to connect to a MongoDB database and I have to put a bunch of driver code into my Lambda function, that can be a little heavyweight. That can be add a little bit of friction, especially if I'm just getting started, right? I'm just trying to build a, a, a toy application that might turn into a business someday. And so what we launched and actually went GA with this at World last week is the data API, which lets you access an Atlas database, whether it's dedicated or serverless through an HTTP call with, you know, the right parameters and, and access keys and all that, but you don't have to stand up a driver and, you know, uh, create a connection every time you want to talk to a MongoDB database from your, you know, function as a service code. So the data API just lets you real quickly just start poking out a, at a, at a MongoDB database works with serverless. So you could just, as I described earlier, create that Atlas serverless instance and use the data API to just, you know, touch it whenever you need to, without having to think too much about it, you know, just so that you can keep focusing on writing, you know, building your application and not worry about, not even worry about how to connect to it. Now, what may happen is you might scale that application over time. You might end up needing some of the functionality that's in the drivers. And at that point, it might make sense for you to switch over to using drivers, but you know, you don't have to, right? The, the data API is there to make, to, just to make it very low friction. Again, back to the concept of friction. It's a very low friction way of using your, your Atlas database from your serverless code or even server full code, if you want to, even the data API doesn't really care. You just, you know, it's just an endpoint. You hit it for whatever code you have. Yeah. So it, it's just, again, let's reduce friction. Let's make it easier, st easier, still easier, uh, for developers to, to get at Atlas however they want. Yeah. And I, and I love the, I, I love that the connection model for DynamoDB anyways, it, it's not much of a problem to use the connection, the, the, the drivers, because you're out, you can be outside of a VPC, right? You don't have to worry about like you do when you're connecting to RDS or something like that. You have to be in, have to be in a VPC, which means then if you want to access the internet from your Lambda functions, you need to have, uh, you know, a managed NAT gateway, which we all know, uh, well, I hope we know how expensive that can be. So I do like that, but that flexibility of the connection model, I mean, that HTTP connection was all always sort of the holy grail for serverless developers like don't make me connect to a vpc but even with the regular connection model it it works really well but we're running out of time and i really want to get this question in because this is something that was a little bit i, I don't want to say a little bit a lot fascinating to me um with the way that uh with the way that mongo db atlas serverless did their pricing so you know, a common complaint often from me <laughs> is that most serverless services from a cost, a cost standpoint scale linearly, right? So the more you use, the cost just keeps going up and to the right. And over time, that can get really, really expensive as compared to provision resources. Now, there is some sort of threshold, the two lines cross, right? Where if you don't have a lot of activity, whatever, you eventually get to the point where it is cheaper to go provisioned or whatever. But I guess the you know, there's that, there's a great flexibility to having on-demand pricing, you know, whether that's for an early app, whether that's for, you know, apps that are low volume, you know, and of course my favorite scale to zero use case is the idea of isolated instances for every single developer, for PRs, for feature branches, things like that, you know, and you don't want to have those, you don't want to have provision resources running in a hundred different accounts, um, you know, that are just charging you when you're not actually using them. So, but what stuck out to me about serverless or Atlas serverless was this idea of the transaction volume discount. So can you explain how that works? Because I think this could be a new pricing model for the way serverless services work. Yeah, no, we saw exactly what you're describing from other serverless offerings that, yeah, the more you use, the more you pay linearly, right? And that can, you know, customers can run into trouble with that model if they're not really sure, if they don't really understand their workload fully down at that level. And so, and we, you know, even in the preview, we launched preview, like I said, last July, we had discount tiers in the pricing model then, but of course, part of the reason for doing a preview is you learn from customers and their right. workloads, et cetera. And our learnings there told us, showed us that we could significantly reduce the prices and still make things work for everybody, you know, for us financially and for customers, uh, obviously financially for them, but also just still keep a, 
a high functioning, you know, reliable, high performing fleet. Um, and so when we went GA, we dropped our prices by about two thirds actually. Mm. And, you know, kind of expanded the discounting, the, the volume discounting. And so, you know, you can see it on the, just on our pricing page, the, the details of that, of how that works, but effectively at scale, it's about a 90% discount if you get up to the higher ends of, of the discounting. Now, this kind of goes hand in hand with something else you mentioned, which is, you know, yeah, I'm playing around and I, I'm just testing things out and it's great that I have this pay as you go model, but I, you know, I might get to a steadier state workload later when it's a more mature application and provision might make more sense. And so, you know, we're, we're working on stuff to make it a lot easier for you to move workloads back and forth between mm. serverless and provisioned so that, Hey, you know, if you need to move to provisioned, great, just push a button and we'll migrate it for you with essentially no downtime and vice versa. So that, that, those capabilities are coming, coming soon for, for the Atlas serverless or the Atlas platform. What I think is going to come later. And I don't think I talked about this even in our, in our talk last week at MongoDB world is the concept of own the base and rent the peaks, mm. which I'm stealing from Corey Quinn, if you know, Corey Quinn. The but, indeed um, we do. Corey Quinn. <laughs> yeah. I he, mean, that's he, a great, well, that's a, that's a great Quinnyism. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure if he coined the phrase, but I heard it from him. But the idea is, hey, you know, if I know my workload's going to be at a certain level most of the time, and it's a non-zero level, and but I need to, I, but I want the serverless capabilities of handling sudden spikes and surges, but I don't want to pay for that peak. Well, maybe I could pay for the base level, you know, pre-pay, pre-provision the base level for a provisioned price, and then mm. have serverless behavior and serverless pricing above that. That's and the so, dream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, because not every workload is at zero and then spikes. A lot of them are right. at some level and then spike. And serverless pricing at the, for that base level is still going to probably be, quote unquote, too expensive or more expensive. And so right. I think eventually we're going to get to a place where we do have a kind of own the own the base, rent the peaks kind of model. Um, it's not in the pricing today, but I think I think we will get there eventually. Yeah, I mean, that'll be amazing because, I mean, if you just look and, and you also say at scale, and that number is not as high as I think some people, and people are like, well, what does scale mean? Well, I, I did the math and it's something like if you spend $5 a day on read capacity for MongoDB, you then start to get a 50% discount on anything over $5. And then it's only like another $25 that you have to spend per day. Again, that's a lot of money that, I mean, not a lot of money, but compared to other things, but then you're up to a 90% discount if you're spending $35 a day or $30 a day or something like that. Whereas something like, you know, even HTTP APIs uh, at AWS for their rest, uh, for their uh, API gateway, they do have discounts, but you have to spend $10 a day just to get a 10% discount, right? And then right, it just doesn't right. go down after that. So I think this is really interesting. And I do love this idea of own, you know, uh, you know, pay for the, or own the base and then pay for the scale or pay, pay for, for the, the overage, pay for the peaks, yeah. right? <laughs> um, I, I do love that. I do love that methodology there and that thinking, because I, I really think that is something that would hold people back say, well, why would I choose a serverless service if I know eventually at this point, it's going to cross that threshold and it's going to get super expensive for me? Yeah, I just think we're going to see that over time as customers bring bigger, more complex workloads into serverless. Right. We're, we're going to see them say that that pattern, they're going to ask for that kind of behavior Absolutely. in the pricing. So MongoDB uh, World was last week. A lot of cool things happened, as you said, right? Uh, Atlas Serverless went GA. And then you also launched a bunch of other exciting things. So two questions. This is one of those sub-question bullets, right? Where it's like that math problem that has like 24 math problems in, inside of it. Right. <laughs> I have what three the... questions, each with 24 parts. Yeah, exactly. It's a 72 <laughs> question question. So I hope everyone has at least three hours. What are the future plans for Atlas Serverless? And then what are some of the other exciting launches that, that people should know about if they missed World or if they just, there's so much going on there where it's like, hey, you should know that this is also happening. Yeah. So first for Serverless, I think I already described, uh, we, we will be adding more capabilities to migrate in and out of Serverless, you know, back to dedicated, et cetera. We did also announce some capabilities like uh, cluster to cluster replication, which will help customers move data from say self-managed Mongo into Atlas or vice versa. And that Atlas could be serverless. So there, there's some replication tooling that we, we announced. Yeah, I'm not gonna remember everything we announced, but I think <laughs> one of the more important things we announced, which got a lot of attention is what we call cr queryable encryption. And so, you know, lots of databases have the ability to do what's called field level encryption, where you encrypt a field in the application. And so it's encrypted across the wire. It was already going to be encrypted with TLS, but it's encrypted 
all the way through, even in the database's memory on the database side. So if, a, if an attacker somehow can dump the memory, the memory cache of that database server, they're going to get encrypted data. They, they still can't see it clear text. Problem is it's hard to query that stuff in the database. You kind of have to do a bunch of work right. after you get it back to the app to decrypt it in the app and do work there. So we've got some technology as part of an acquisition we did, you know, in the last couple of years that we've incorporated in MongoDB that basically lets you run queries in the server on encrypted data while it stays encrypted. And so the attacker can dump memory all they like. They'll never see on encrypted data, but the queries are still going to run, you know, run well, good performance at scale, that kind of thing. And so we think that's a big differentiator for, for Atlas as compared to, you know, our competitors. And that did get a lot of press when you, when you dig into it for that exact reason, that it looks like an interesting enhancement that we put in that makes it that much harder for attackers to get at your data, even if they can, you know, get to the server, even they, even they get root on the server, that just doesn't map. They still can't see it, it see any right. of it in clear text. So that's gotten a lot of, a lot of attention. We added some capabilities to Atlas search. So Atlas search, basically you push a button on your Atlas instance and we will build a Lucene search index right next to your instance. And then you can do all kinds of fancy Lucene based searching. We've added support for what we call facets in Atlas search, which let you do fancier searching and sub searching and all kinds of stuff that I don't fully understand because I'm not a search <laughs> genius, but, um, but yeah, so Atlas search is cool. Like I said, you just push this, push the button or make the API call and we build and manage the search index for you. Um, on whichever parts of your data you want us to do that for. I will rant about this. Search is your only hope in life, right? <laughs> this is why Google is who they are, because they figured that out early. But, you know, and Yahoo didn't, right? Yahoo thought that they could build a directory that would categorize all the websites out there. And that worked for a while until people started creating too many websites. And that was, right. you know, your only hope is search. Your only hope is search for any pile of data. And so search is just hugely important. And uh, as people put more data more and more data into their databases. Right. And then there's a there's a stuff with the developer platform. What's what's the developer, developer platform? Developer database platform. Developer Something. database platform. Yeah. What's we, that all we, about? Yeah, we call it the developer data platform. Data right. Platform. And and some of it is simply, hey, let's just give people a, a conceptual way to understand and describe all these different capabilities. Like for example, you know, in MongoDB itself, you can manage lots of different types of data. Of course, the, the base document or JSON data, but also time series and graph data and key value data. You can manage data in a relational way if you want, though it's kind of an anti-pattern because we, you know, we have full support for ACID and transactions and you can, you know, you can join data between collections, though you probably shouldn't because that's not how you should use MongoDB, but you can. So there's different, all these different ways of managing data, some of which we only just added in the last year or two, right? Then there's the data API, which gives you, you know, uh, a different way to access the data. The queryable encryption we've talked about, the migrator, we're, you know, and then there's a bunch of capabilities we added on the analytics side, right? With, especially with uh, data federation mm -hmm. um, or query federation, if you want to call it that, where basically you can run a query in your Atlas instance that can access data in that instance, of course, but also access data from other data sources, all from within that one query without having to think too hard about it, right? You know, once you set up the connections to those data sources, including just files and S3 buckets, and then we added support for SQL. So Atlas SQL lets you use SQL to access your instance. And we have connectors to Tableau and I think JDBC right now, so that you can, when you want to, when it makes sense, you can use SQL to, you know, access the data in your instance and not, you know, you may have like Tableau itself, but you may also have people who in your, in your company who understand SQL and don't, don't understand MQL, Mago query language. Right. So, you know, we're just trying to broaden the, the ways you can access and use the Atlas platform for managing data. So that's, so that's the, the, we try to encapsulate all that in what we call the, the developer data platform. Nice. Well, it sounds like your dog is very excited about it, which is uh, yeah, which is yeah, great. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so we also in the talk that you and I gave you, you went into some stuff about tuning, auto tuning, and some stuff like that. So I think our talk is going to be published. It'll be available. People can yeah. see that. So I'll leave that as a uh, as a homework assignment. But uh, Kevin, thank you so much for being here. This is awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited. You. 
about what, what Mongo is doing. Um, there's a couple of other data, ser serverless database companies that are are trying things like this as well. I just love this idea of pushing the market and really pushing this. But but yeah, thank you so much. So if people want to find out more about MongoDB Atlas or Atlas Serverless or find out more about you, what are the best ways for them to do that? Yeah, I mean, obviously our website um, has lots of information on it. But honestly, go to the console and create, you know, poke around, create an instance. You'll see how easy it is. Yeah, you have to create an account, but, you know, that's kind of standard these days. But, but you have to tell us who you are. But um, but then, you know, you see how easy it is to actually create and, and use a serverless instance. And there's lots of examples and tutorials, and MongoDB University has a lot of useful stuff. You know, most most of that's free, all the courseware and how to, how to use MongoDB, how to use Atlas. So, yeah, there's a lot of resources on our website. And just, I mean, the best way to learn is to do it, just go go poke at it and see what happens. Cool. Well, we will put all this in the show notes, especially or in addition to how people can find you both on Twitter and LinkedIn, Kate Jernigan. Yeah. And if anyone needs to find any of that, all the notes will be where they always go for the shows. And Kevin, thank you so much again. It was so nice to have you. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Jeremy. This has been great. And that's this week's serverless chat. Rebecca and I want to give a huge thank you to Kevin Jernigan for being our guest this week and to our sponsor, DexSecure. If you want to check out the show notes and a full transcript of this episode, you can find them at serverlesschats.com slash 141. For more serverless chat, subscribe, sound with be an insider, check us out on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can connect with Rebecca on Twitter, at Becca Odele, and me, at Jeremy underscore Daily. And if you want to keep up to date on everything serverless, make sure you subscribe to the Off by None newsletter at offbynone.io. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to chatting with all of you again next week.